we are going to be in 2 Peter chapter 3 here in just a little bit, but most of you are aware of the fact that Dory and I just got back from a wonderful Thanksgiving trip to Texas. We had beautiful weather. We were on the jet ski on the lake on Thanksgiving and the day after that. That was awesome. Beautiful weather, awesome family, wonderful food, and the cutest grandbaby in the world. <laughs> the drive down was pretty good as well. We were real fortunate. We had uh, saved enough points over various hotel stays over the years. We didn't have to pay for a hotel all the way down there or all the way back. It was awesome. The only drawback to the whole thing is I have discovered after having my mid-sized pickup about three years, my legs are evidently not built right for mid-sized pickups. And that was about the only problem we had, and we're working on a solution to that. But otherwise, the trip was just really fantastic. I love traveling with my wife. We like a lot of the same things. We like eating at the same kind of restaurants. We like listening to the same books on tape, seeing the same scenery. It's all just really wonderful. The only problem with going on vacations and traveling like that is the week before you leave. All of the stuff that has to be done that never seems to get done in time. Now, some might say that I have a problem with procrastination. I would not say that yet. I think there is a cosmic conspiracy against you. Because think about it. Every year in the past that I can remember, the week before Christmas, the week before Thanksgiving, all the leaves would have already fallen and been cleaned up. But this year, they wait until the week we're getting ready to leave, and then all the leaves fall off of my tree at one time. Now, you tell me there's not a cosmic conspiracy. My dirty laundry breeds at night. Because there's more there in the morning than there was before. So getting all the laundry done before you leave, it takes a lot more time. But seriously, this trip, I was planned, I was ready to go a lot quicker than I usually am. My bag was packed a week and a half before. It wasn't that I was excited about going to see the baby. I'll tell you that. But my bag was packed, and I had kind of a middle list of all the things that needed to be done. And I got it all pretty much done when we left that Sunday after church, I felt like we were pretty much ready to go. But I want you to think about this morning. Planning for a trip when you don't know when you're going to leave. And here's an example. Let's say, for instance, one day Chuck calls you. Now, for those of you that don't know, Chuck and Cindy uh, run a business where they sell uh, tour packages. Cruises and things like that. It's called Cruises, Inc. And you can pay me later for this advertisement, Chuck. <laughs> but let's say one day Chuck calls you up out of the blue and says, Hey, I have free tickets for an all-expenses-paid cruise to Alaska. And I want to take you with me on this cruise. And you're like, yeah, cool. When do we leave? And Chuck says... I'll let you know when we're leaving right now. You just need to get packed and ready for the trip. And then he hangs up. And so you, man, you're excited. This is really cool. And so you go online and you look at what do I need to take on a cruise to Alaska and what's the weather like in Alaska. And you get out your suitcases and you're getting packed because for all you know, you're leaving tomorrow. And so you get everything ready to go and one day goes by and another day goes by and Third day goes by and you haven't heard anything back from Chuck and so you give him a call one day and and uh, you say, hey Chuck, what's the deal with this uh, Alaskan cruise? And he says, you just be ready. I'll let you know as soon as I find out and, and when we're ready to go, you just need to make sure that you're ready. Cool. Sounds good. So then another week goes by. Now, you only own so many pairs of underwear, and you've got all of them that you need packed in there, and as time has gone by, you're actually having to pull some out of there and wear them, but then you want to make sure that you're packed and ready to go, so you're, you find yourself doing these small loads of laundry so that you can keep the bags packed and ready to go. 
But then a month goes by and the seasons have now changed. It's no longer spring in Alaska. We're moving along into summer. And some of the stuff that you packed isn't going to work, so you're kind of reshifting that bag so that as soon as Chuck calls you, you're ready to go. Another month goes by. And now we're moving into fall. And you're beginning to kind of wonder about this because you also realize that the cruise season in Alaska only lasts so long. And so you're not sure. So you don't want to pester Chuck, but you want to call him and see if something's going on. So you make up a problem with your computer. Or maybe you just bought a new drone and you need some advice on it. And you just, some reason to call Chuck and ask him about something. And you hope that he'll bring up this cruise. And he doesn't. And so you're just kind of like, well, I don't know for sure what to do. So you keep the bag ready, and, and then the end of that cruise season in Alaska comes and goes, and so you just repack for spring. Must be next spring that we're going to go on this cruise. The next sea tour season opens, no call from Chuck. You're repacking your bag, washing laundry, keeping up with the weather and everything, and every now and then you'll ask Chuck, you know, hey Chuck, about this cruise, you know, we, we, any idea when this is going to happen? And Chuck, man, is like, just be ready. I am so excited. You are going to love Alaska. Just be ready. So you keep your suitcase ready to go. Another year goes by. And you got this suitcase in the middle of your floor, and you're always having to do all of this stuff. And, but every time you talk to Chuck, Chuck is like, man, you are going to love Alaska. <coughs> well, when are we going, Chuck? Just be ready. All right. Another year goes by. Repacking that bag constantly, washing, doing laundry, putting things back in there, changing it for all of the seasons and everything. Another year goes by. One morning you get up and you open the newspaper and you're flipping through it. And as is your habit, you flip through the obituaries to make sure you're not in there. And guess what you see in the obituary? There's Chuck's picture. <laughs> and, and you are heartbroken. Not because you're missing an Alaskan cruise, but you love your brother, you know, and you're worried about Cindy and everything. And so you go to the visitation, and when you come up in the line there, Cindy is standing there, and she says, Oh, Chuck is so excited about your trip to Alaska. And, and he told me, he said, he really wished he could have been there, you know, to go with you and everything, but, but he is so excited for you to go on this trip. And now you're like, now wait a minute. First of all, he, he, Chuck made it sound like this Alaska trip was something that was going to be happening pretty quick. And then he said he wanted me to go with him. But Chuck's not here anymore. But yet Cindy is making it sound like it's still, a, 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 it's still on. So you go home. Make sure your bag is packed. And you're ready to go. And then time goes on and that tour season ends. Repack again for spring. One night you have a friend over and the friend happens to walk by your bedroom and looks in there and he knows what that suitcase is because you've told him about it before. You've told him about this Alaskan cruise you're going on, you know, and you're just waiting for the tickets to come up. And, and so he looks in there and he said, and he said, you still got that suitcase in there? Dude, you've been doing that for years. You do realize how silly this is. I mean, you really think that now, after all of these years, and even after Chuck has passed on, you think you're still going on an Alaskan cruise? And some doubt begins to creep into your mind. And so you find yourself, that, see, that tour season, when you do use laundry out of there and you wash it, you don't put all of it back in the suitcase. You just put it back in the door because you think, you know what? If a ticket should just mysteriously appear in the mail or something, I'll have time to get my luggage, my laundry out of the drawer and get it packed. As the seasons change and you start wearing the warmer stuff out of the bag, you find yourself not putting it back in there. You just put it back in the closet and stuff. Because after all, you reason that, you know, if the tickets do mysteriously show up, I'll have time to know what to pack. I've repacked that bag so many times. I'll know that it's, I've got time. I can put some stuff in there and I'll be ready to go. It won't take me more than 15, 20 minutes to get everything completely packed. 
By the end of that next year, the bags are empty. You've still got them out there in case you need to pack in a hurry, but you get kind of tired of tripping over them, and so one day you just decide, I just shove them under the bed. They're out of my way. Probably never going to happen anymore. A couple more years go by, and about 2 o'clock one morning, you wake up, you're wondering, what was that? And you get out of bed and you go to the front door and you open it up and there's a taxi cab parked outside. The guy's standing there with a ticket for an all expense plane cruise to Alaska. And he says, I'm here to pick up your bags. I know you're in your pajamas. I, we've got about 10 minutes to leave. Your flight leaves from the airport in a half an hour. And we, it takes us 20 minutes to get there. While you're getting dressed, I'll load your bags. And you know there is no way you're going to be ready. And you missed that opportunity. This is exactly what Peter is dealing with in 2 Peter chapter 3. These members in the church there, these Christians who have been told, guys, you, you're going someplace awesome, you know, that song we just sang, you know, happy forevermore when we meet on that shore, that place that we're all going to, that's going to be an awesome place. And these Christians have been told, you're leaving this place, this place of sadness and sorrow and suffering and sin. That all started with an S. That was pretty cool. You're, you guys are going to be leaving this place and going to a place of perfection where righteousness dwells because you are in the presence of God all the time. Everything in this world is going to pass away, but you've got to be ready. And you've got to stay ready. You've got to stay the course and be on that road when the time comes because when Christ returns, it's going to be too late because then you're going. But there are people who have come in who have said, you know, you realize how long people have been waiting for this second coming? Even some of those who promised it. I mean, Jesus said, there are some of you here today who will not sleep before you see the Son of Man coming. And those people have died. Do you really think this is going to happen now? I mean, there are people here in this building. Some of you have been walking with Christ 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 Plus years. He still hadn't come. Do you realize how foolish that is? To be holding on to that hope for that long? And so Peter writes to the church there to tell them how important it is for them to hold on. So read with me 2 Peter chapter 3. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as a reminder as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on just as it has since the beginning of creation. In other words, they say nothing has ever changed in the world. God started it up and set it off in motion, and then He's withdrawn, and He's never been involved, and He's not going to be involved now. Come on, that's foolish. And then in verse 5, He says, But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's Word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and with water. By water also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are, are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. What Peter is saying is these people think God's never been involved in the world, but He has. He spoke the world into existence, created it out of water, and then He used that same water to wipe out ungodly men. 
And by that same word, God who holds everything in his existence is holding the world, waiting for his final judgment by fire when the ungodly men will be destroyed. But don't forget, verse 8, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Now, by the way, just so you know that, you, Paul, Peter is not writing this to describe how long did creation occur in Genesis chapter 1. There's always this debate. Was, it, was a day a day, or was it a thousand years? Because with God, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Peter could care less how long it took God to create the, word, the world, just the fact that he did. But what his point is, guys, our time frame is not the same as God's. You and I live within a limited time frame. We're born, we will die. And everything that we accomplish has to be done within that time frame. God does not exist within that time frame. So our view of time is not his. That's what Peter is saying. With God, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. God is The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises as, a, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. If you remember back, Jesus, when they asked Him, they said, Lord, when is all of this going to happen? And Jesus said, I don't know. Going to come like a thief in the night. And Peter is saying, guys, yes, it hasn't come yet. Yes, we've been waiting and it hasn't come yet, but that doesn't mean God is slow. It doesn't mean God is forgotten. It means God is patient, waiting for you to repent because God does not want to bring about the end of the world when there's somebody that still might repent. Because when the end of that world comes, Ungodly men will be destroyed. Ungodly women will be destroyed. And God says, I want to give them time to repent. That is why He's waiting. It's not saying it's not going to happen. It's not happening yet because God wants for everyone to be saved and He wants to give them time to repent. In verse 10, He said, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Keep that in mind. Like a thief. Tasha out in Denver had her car broken into one time. I said, well, did you plan it? What do you mean did I plan it? Well, did you send the thief an invitation? I mean, isn't that the way you do it? You plan when you want to be robbed? Any of you ever had your house broken into or your car broken into? Did you send them an invitation? Did they call you and set up an appointment? No. It just happened. It happened suddenly when you did not expect it, and that is when Christ will return. The, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar by uh, the elements will be destroyed by fire, the earth, and everything in it will be laid bare. And since everything will be laid bare, it will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Now here's something we need to keep in mind. How many of you are looking forward to the day of destruction? Not because I want to suffer through that destruction, but because I want what's on the other side of that destruction. Because what's on the other side of that destruction is perfection. You see, all of this world, with all of its pain and its sorrow and its sinfulness, is going to be destroyed. And on the other side of that is a new heaven and a new earth where we live in righteousness. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more surgeries, no more cancer, life and a banquet that I'm sure has millionaire pie. <laughs> Me. It's perfect. And so we long for that. And so what Peter's saying is so since that, since we long for that, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, you ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. 
that they will bring about the destruction of the heaven by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But, but, in, but in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And so then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that the Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom God, that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. In other words, Paul, even Paul tells you, guys, you've got to be ready because we're waiting for that other place we're going. And you've got to be prepared and you've got to stay ready for it. You've got to keep moving in that direction at all times. Then he says, but some people, going on back to verse uh, 16, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. I think Peter is saying, these guys that are coming in telling you that it's not going to happen, they've distorted some things because they don't understand. They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand the second coming. They don't understand the eternity that we have. They're so focused on the here and the now that they can't look beyond it. Therefore, verse 17, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard. So that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter is telling the church, guys, you've got to be ready. You know the truth. Hold on to it. Let it shape how you live your life. Pursue the things that will keep you righteous and keep you holy so that when He returns, you're ready to go. Let's pray. Father, we ask You to be with us and help us. Father, we long for that day that Your Son returns. That day when all of our troubles and all of our worries, all of our pain, all of our suffering, all of our emotional turmoil will be gone. For that day, Father, when we are reunited with our loved ones who have gone on before us. For that day that we will join in the singing of a new song. And we will sit and we will watch in the presence of God Almighty as the angels circle around and say, Holy, holy, holy. Father, we long for that day. But right now we're living in a time of struggle. We live in a world that tries to lure us away from that. Father, we suffer. We hurt. We weep. We mourn. We're in pain. Father, help us to remember the place we're going. Help us to remain strong until that day we get there. Thank you for, for providing the church, the place where we can, can come and be strengthened all the more as we see that day approaching. And thank you for your son who came and opened the way for us to get there. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be here today struggling with your faith, wondering how long do you have to keep waiting? Wondering how much more do I have to endure? How much more do I have to suffer? I need somebody to help me stay strong. And if that's where you are today, we want to offer help. We're going to stand in just a second. We're going to sing a song. And, and if you need to come down and say, Lance, I need somebody to walk through this with me because I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm about to give up and I don't want to do that. Come down and let me know that. Maybe there is somebody here this morning who's never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And here's what I need to tell you. Without accepting Jesus Christ, 
without accepting Him as Lord and Savior and dying to your old self in baptism and being raised to new life, you have no hope of that eternal life. Amen. And on that day when He returns and all of this is destroyed, you will be destroyed with Him. But you don't have to be. Because God has waited up till today to give you an opportunity to be redeemed. And if you need to take advantage of that, today's your day. Come to the front and let us know that while we stand and say this. <laughs>